So as Sebastian already said, we just got a new overstop then, a few months ago, but still pretty recently. Um, and I've seen this resource used a lot. The OWASP top 10 is used as a base for some classes on web security at university. A lot of companies focus their program on this top 10. And really, it's a good resource. We have some nice explanation of these categories. And uh, there are also nice cheat sheets on how to solve some of these things for different programming languages and frameworks. It's really useful. And a lot of us probably have used it before. So now that we have a new version, we, uh, the previous one was back from 2017, and all of us together have focused on these top 10 categories for, for four years, five years by now. We are rid the world of these problems, and we're ready for the next 10. Am I right? Not really. So actually, none of the 10 categories have left the top 10. Yes, we have a few new categories such as insecure design, software and data integrity failures, and server-side request forgery, but none of them have left the top 10. They just kind of merged together, like XML external entity who became part of security misconfiguration, cross-site scripting that became part of injection. So how is it possible that all of us focusing on these top 10 categories and we still haven't pushed one from the top 10. Well, the task of the security professionals is to detect these problems in the code. And we've gotten pretty good at this. With the automation of security tools, we are able to detect these problems quite well. In fact, the top 10 is made with data from these very tools. The next step is to fix these problems or maybe prevent them from happening in the first place. And that is the task of the developer. But to do this, developers are often handed repurposed training and tools that is actually intended for security professionals. These do not integrate well into their workflows, and they are disliked and sometimes even disabled by developers. They're a big inhibitor of their productivity. My name is Peter de Kremer, and I recently graduated with a PhD from Ghent University. And during this time, I did research for a company called Secure Code Warrior, backed by a bakkeland mandat from the Flemish Agentschap of Innoveren en Ondernemen, VLAIO. And after I graduated, I'm now working for a company called R2C. I'll actually move my cursor away. Oh, that doesn't help. And during this time in my research, I built a vision of a more developer-friendly, a more human-centered approach to software security, which I've called the paved path methodology. In this methodology, we don't want to force security testing onto developers, but instead build a paved path. We will decide on API level guidelines, standards, and patterns that describe how to achieve security critical features. When developers then build new functionality that needs these features, they can follow these guidelines. They can follow the paved path that has been laid out for them. Today, I will talk to you about this methodology from a high level and how it can be applied to provide better training and tools to developers. In the training, I will focus on the training provided by Secure Code Warrior as an example. And for the tools, I will take a look at Sensei, an IDE plugin provided by Secure Code Warrior, and also SEMGRIP, a CLI tool provided by R2C. But first, the methodology. So software security started as part of software testing. Historically, it was done at the right or the end of the software development life cycle. However, because of the increased speed of development with Agile and DevOps methodologies, and also because security professionals are understaffed with only one security professional being hired, on average for up to 200 developers, a shift left movement is ongoing, where security is addressed earlier or more to the left in the software development lifecycle. 
In this methodology, in this shift left movement, developers are made responsible for the security of their own code. And as I said before, they are too often handed repurposed training and tools that is intended for security professionals. And these tools fundamentally use a reactive approach. They scan completed code or partially completed code and provide feedback to the developers after the fact. They scan for vulnerabilities. With the PavePath methodology, we want to take a more proactive approach and instead provide guidelines that when adhered to will lead to secure code free from these vulnerabilities. In line with this methodology, the training and tools that we provide to developers should be relevant to their work, as they should be efficient in meeting their needs, and they should be usable, well integrated into their workflows so that they do not inhibit their productivity. So what does this look like for training? Well, in order to understand what makes good training, we need to know how information is stored in our memories. And information is stored as a series of associations. When I think about Kotlin, I know it is a programming language. It is usable for Android applications. It is made by JetBrains. And I also remember I learned about this while eating pizza uh, with Pizza Tuesdays at work. This association might seem random, but all of the association in our memory can help us retrieve information from our recollection. So even those need to be relevant to the context in which a developer will recollect this information, that is, during their work. So we want the work context to be related to the training context. This is one of the reasons why why pilots do not learn to fly airplanes by looking at PowerPoint presentations, but by using flight simulators. Similarly, we do not want to teach developers secure coding through PowerPoint presentations, but we need to have them working in real code, in the language and framework that they are working on daily, and uh, in types of applications that they are used to. Of course, repetition in, in strengthens the associations in our memory. So enough repetition will also make it easier to remember. But too much repetition inhibits the productivity of the developer. So we also need to be efficient. Finally, we want to keep the developer engaged and coming back to the training when they need to. And so it should be fun and usable. Um, at Secure Code Warrior, the first, the relevant part is very uh, applicable. They have training in defensive exercises, so not penetration testing, but secure coding exercises in a wide range of languages and frameworks. It is also fun. There are some gamification features and competitive elements. When I found during my PhD, the efficiency was lacking. Some of the, uh, the users on the platform were following, uh, so all of the users were following some of the predetermined courses and they do not match the individual learning pace of each user. So I tried to build, I built an intelligent tutoring system. In the main loop of the system, users are served exercises. Their answers are processed before they are stored in history. This user history can then be used to make better exercise selection. Exercise selection I've implemented as a collaborative filtering algorithm. A collaborative filtering algorithm is similarly to Netflix. You will find like-minded users and make recommendations based on their preferences. So if some of you like the same movies as I do and dislike the same movies as I do, then your collective preferences can be used to make a recommendation for me. However, in training in a learning platform, there need to be some adaptations to such an algorithm. Take, for example, a new user to the platform who is also new at software security. They are tackling some of the first exercises, exercise zero and exercise one, and they find them useful, they learn something new, and hence the check marks. Now this user stays on board, they learn a lot over time, and by the end they become an expert. They solve exercises 100 and 101, and they still learn something new. A new user who joins our platform, but who is already a security expert, might also try these exercises. They find these useful, and so a classic collaborative algorithm, as you can imagine, might find these two users to be like-minded, and hence would be uh, 
trying to recommend exercise zero and exercise one to this user. However, these exercises were only useful to user A because they were a beginner. They might not be useful to user B who is already an expert. So the ability level of a user at the time of uh, solving an exercise is very important. Trying to find this ability level, however, is not an easy task. We cannot simply look at the accuracy of a user uh, on trying some exercises. For example, here, user A and B both uh, answered two out of three questions correctly, but user A was trying hard exercises and user B was trying easy exercises. So it's more likely that user E would be of a higher ability level. Um, so, in order to improve this intelligent tutoring system, I need to continuously estimate both the ability of the user and the difficulty of the exercises to make better recommendations. For this, I have used what is called item response theory, a theory from the field of psychometrics. In this theory, the user ability is considered a latent trait, something that we cannot measure directly. We cannot simply scan somebody's brain and determine this is their ability level at software security. However, what we can do is ask them questions, and this is of course a manifest variable. We can observe their answers, and, and of course there is a relationship between these two. And this is what is modeled in item response theory. P, the probability of a correct answer, given theta, the ability level of a user. In particular, I used the two-parameter logistic model, which looks like this. So the horizontal axis is the user ability, which goes from low to high. And the vertical axis is the probability of a correct answer. This is for one particular exercise, and as you can see, the higher the ability level of the user, the more likely they are to answer this question correctly. This is called the two-parameter logistic model, because there are two parameters. First is called the discrimination parameter, and it corresponds to three different steepnesses. On, if, as you can see, if I uh, create three different exercises with this different discrimination parameters, this corresponds to the steepness of the curve. If we take a look at the exercise represented by the yellow line, um, then we can say, based on a correct answer, that the ability level of the user is about this high or higher, at least. However, for a correct answer on the orange question, it is much harder to make such an assumption. So the exercise in yellow is better at discriminating between users of high and low ability level, hence the discrimination parameter. The second parameter is the difficulty parameter, and this corresponds to a translation on the x-axis. And if we take a look at a user of about average ability, we can see that it's very unlikely to, that this user answers the yellow question correctly, but very likely that they are answering the orange question correctly. So this is the difficulty of an exercise. The next task is to create a curve like this for every exercise on the Secure Code Warrior platform, which is several thousand. And we can do this based on the observed data of the hundred thousand of users on the Secure Code Warrior platform. This is quite a mathematically complex problem, but intuitively it is an easy process to understand. So I will again use an example. So say this is the observed data we have. There are a few users, a few exercises, and we don't know a lot about them. Well, if we take a look at the data, we can see that user A was answering most questions correctly. They made one error. Of course, it's just possible that user A was very lucky, but the more data we observe, the more likely this is because user A has a high ability level. And users B and C who answers more questions incorrectly, they might be just unlucky, but it's more likely that this is because they have a lower ability level. So the algorithm is really a uh, likelihood maximization. We will tune the parameters to make the observed data as likely as possible to be observed. And in this case, this is more likely if user A has a high ability level and users B and C a lower ability level. We can do the same for the exercises. Exercise four is answered incorrectly by all users, even those of high ability level. So it is most likely a difficult exercise. 
Exercise zero, on the other hand, is answered correctly by all users, even those low of low ability level, so it is most likely an easy exercise. And let's take exercise one, two, and three somewhere in the middle. So we just configured our model. We trained our model based on the observed data. Now we can learn something from this trained model. We can take a look at these exercises. They are not just anonymous exercises. They are in a certain language. They are about a certain vulnerability type. So let's take a look and imagine our data set is like this. Cross-site request forgery has a hard and a medium exercise. And SQL injection has an easy and a medium exercise. So we could say, on average, SQL injection is easier to understand and fix, at least in training, than cross-site request forgery. With XXE, we only have one medium exercise. It could still be as easy as SQL or as hard as cross-site request forgery. We don't really have enough data. So I had to perform some statistical tests to make sure that the conclusions I'm doing are correct, which, for which I used a Welch ANOVA and a Games Howell post hoc test. And these are some of my conclusions. When the language of the exercise is a, uh, a language that requires memory management or use of pointers, the exercise is on, on average dif more difficult. So COBOL, C++, and C are more difficult to get security right compared to Python, C Sharp, and Java. This is most likely explained because use of pointer and memory management in increases the cognitive burden of the developer. Not only are there additional attack uh, uh, vulnerabilities possible, such as buffer overflows, which are not possible on memory-safe languages, but also simply writing correct functional code already requires a larger effort from the developer. So there is less left in their cognitive burden to take care of the security at the same time. Surprisingly, use of frameworks also increases the difficulty. If we look at Python Django, for example, it is more difficult than plain Python. And this is true for a lot of the frameworks uh, in the data set. This is also the same results as other research who uh, looked at similar problems. Use of frameworks increases the chance of making security errors. This is most likely explained by the fact that in order to write secure code in a plain language, you need sufficient security knowledge. But when using a framework, on top of that, you also need to know the implementation details of the framework to make sure they adhere to the standards that you require. So in, again, there is an increased cognitive burden to get security right when using frameworks compared to plain languages. I also found that mobile development on average is harder than uh, web development. <clears throat> this is most likely explained because with mobile development, the device is in the hands of an attacker and there are additional attack factors such as the device can be rooted or some backups can be tampered with, for example. Finally, for the vulnerability type, I found that the size of the related code fragment is a big indicator for the difficulty. Uh, vulnerability types which require large pieces of code to be analyzed or changed in order to fix the problem are typically much harder than local problems. And in fact, you can see injection is one of the very easiest problems uh, in the on, on the Secure Code Warrior platform. And this is surprising, as until the previous version of the OS Top 10, injection was number one, and it still is number three on the OS Top 10 list. So how can we explain this apparent gap between training and practice? Clearly, developers understand and think injection flaws are easy to, to understand and solve in training, but still it happens a lot in practice. Well, this is because the developers are preoccupied with the, the, uh, the functional requirements of their code, and they cannot take care of security at the same time. So we should solve this with tools, better tools that help them take care of and remind them of the security of their code while not uh, hindering their productivity. And that is the goal of the tools in the Pave Path methodology. We will lessen the cognitive burden and try to have minimal harm on their productivity at the same time. In the Pave Path methodology, 
we want to make tools as relevant as possible. So the guidelines that we are enforcing, they should be project specific. They should not just be generally applicable because then they are less likely to be relevant to the developer. We want this to be specific for each project, for each company, so it needs to be easy to customize these rules. It should also be efficient. We want the scan times to be as fast as possible. In fact, with Sensei and SEMGRIP, they are nearly real time, and hence they are well integrated into the developer workflows. They can function similarly to spell checkers, but for security of the code. <laughs> And finally, they should be usable. We should not just detect mistakes and point them out to developers, but really help them fix these problems. And this is why we provide quick fixes. <clears throat> so I already talked to you about the reactive approach of traditional security tools. And this is why they cannot do, can, they cannot meet these requirements. They will scan partially or completely code, completely completed code for problems. So in order to determine whether or not a routine contains a vulnerability, they need enough of the calling context. They need to scan the code to determine if there is a path through which unsanitized user input can reach this routine. This requires scanning large pieces of code, which is slow and also requires this code to already be finished. And it's perfectly possible at the time of developing a certain routine that no such path exists. And hence, at that time, no vulnerability can be detected by these tools. Only later in development, this routine is reused from a different context, and now a vulnerability can be detected. This requires the developer to go back into this routine, potentially long after it has been initially developed, to then secure this which is, of course, not efficient use of their, of their time. With the paved path methodology, we try to be more proactive and we will enforce secure coding guidelines regardless of whether this context exists. We can assume that at some point in the future, such a calling context may exist and at this time a vulnerability will be present and we should just secure this routine from the start. We should have a uh, secure by design approach and we will enforce secure coding guidelines regardless of the context of the code. So an example of this is uh, use of parameterized queries. We have a routine here called get account by ID that uses some parameters from elsewhere in the code. A query is built that uses concatenation and hence if this routine is used somewhere and the string parameters user and ID contain unsanitized user input, at this time this might result in a SQL injection. With the paved path methodology, we do not care. We simply say always use parameterized queries. Whether or not this get account by ID is already called somewhere or not, we will call this a uh, violation of the guideline. And of course, the, the resolution is to use parameterized queries. So I said in order to be relevant to the developer's workflow, we want to customize these guidelines. And with Sensei, this can be done in, an, in the IDE using the, uh, edit, uh, the recipe editor. On the left here, you have the recipe itself in YAML code. And there is also a UI view to more easily uh, ed edit it. And as you can see, we are looking for a method call of the name add cookie of the type HTTP servlet response with a cookie argument. On the right here, there is a live preview of the code which will show which part of the code is marked by this rule. On SEMGRAP, this can be done in a web app and it is very, a very similar syntax. You can see the pattern is looking for a HTTP servlet response object which uses the add cookie method and a cookie in the argument. And of course, we also have a preview of which part of the code will be marked. So I set up a controlled experiment with students in the HOEST um, of the Computer and Cybercrime Professional uh, Program in Bruges. And their task was to complete several features of a web application and some of them received help from Sensei and others had Sensei installed and only uh, Sensei was only used to monitor their behavior. 
I compared this to uh, other tools that also did similar research, and I found that Sensei and Tricorder took tools that customize the guidelines and really tune it to the specific project, have a, a larger increased engagement compared to other tools who just use generally applicable uh, rules, such as OWASP aside, spot bugs, and early security vulnerability detector. As you can see, there is quite a clear gap. Sensei and Tricorder, almost all markings are addressed. In the next step, I talked to you that the tools also need to be efficient and usable. And so they need to, the scans need to be fast, almost real time. And we also need to provide remediation guidance to developers. In Sensei, this can be done in the second tab of the uh, editor. And you can see the actions are to rewrite it to default HTTP utilities at cookie. And this is uh, a method from the OWASP ASAPI library. On the bottom, you can see a live preview of what this fix would look like if it is applied. And Sensei is an IDE plugin, so its quick fixes are available just like any other quick fix in your IDE by using uh, Alt-Enter and then selecting the option, this code transformation will be applied. SEMGRAB has a similar syntax, but here it is still part of the rule. In the bottom you can see fix, which is using the default HTTP utilities, and a fix is previewed in the command line uh, like this. You can see that the original add cookie will be replaced with this uh, add cookie from the SAP library, and applying a fix is done with dash dash auto fix uh, when running SEMGRAB. So I tested whether or not these quick fixes have an impact on the students. In the test group and the control group, several uh, guidelines were violated during their programming assignment. The test group on average 17.6 violations and the control group on average 24.7 violations. A statistical test showed that it's not statistically significantly different, so we can say they have introduced a similar amount of guideline violations during their assignment. But at the end, there is a clear difference. Users who had quick fixes available, 79% uh, of them finished their assignment free of guideline violations. And for the control group, only 6% finished their assignment free of coding guideline violations. Also, the speed is greatly increased with the test group that had quick fixes available. The average fix took 19 seconds. And with the control group, it took over two minutes. Um, this also corresponded to different uh, vulnerabilities. So some of the file upload vulnerabilities during the assignment took the longest to fix, while uh, cross-site scripting and SQL injection clearly took only a few seconds on average to fix, which indicates again that even though these are vulnerabilities that are occurring a lot in practice and that are high on the OS top 10, these are quite easy to understand for developers, and really the problem is providing them with more applicable, more developer-friendly tools instead. So I talked to you today about the methodology, how re, uh, the traditional security tools use a reactive approach, and this fundamentally is uh, inhibiting the productivity of the developer because it is slower and it becomes after the fact. With the PavePath methodology, I want to take a more proactive approach and enforce secure coding guidelines instead of scanning for vulnerabilities. Um, in line with this methodology, the training and tools should be usable, efficient, and relevant. For the training to be relevant, this means that we want to provide the developers with defensive exercises in the language and framework they want. For it to be efficient, we need to adapt the learning pace to the developer itself, and we found that some indicators of difficulty are use of memory and safe languages, use of frameworks, mobile development, and the size of the related code fragments for vulnerabilities. And for it to be usable, the training should be fun and keep the developer engaged. With tools, in order for them to be relevant, we need to, to be able to customize the guidelines that are enforced. In order for them to be efficient, the the quick, the, the speed should be fast and well integrated. The scans should be done within almost real time. And in order for them to be usable, we provide quick fixes. 
And, and I hope that with this Pave Path methodology, maybe by the next iteration, we can finally push some of these categories out of the top 10 because developers clearly understand some of these problems and they don't think they are difficult, but they keep occurring because they are preoccupied with the functionality of the code. I also have a summary in my slide deck, uh, which will be published. Thank you, Peter. Any uh, any questions for Peter on this paved path methodology? Thank you, Peter. That was an interesting talk and uh, I think very interesting research. I was really surprised to learn that using a framework makes it more likely to make security mistakes. I mean, we all know about this don't roll your own crypto, which has been adopted to don't write your own code, but use the section, the security functionality of mm -hmm. the framework. Do, do you see, and I've seen research supporting that. <laughs> so you're contradicting this. Uh, how do you explain this, or is there a way around it? So we, what do the frameworks have to do that developers use them in a secure way, so to say? Or should really developers write their own authentication functions now? I, I agree that uh, frameworks are supposed to make our life easier and automate some of these things. But my research, as well as some other uh, uh, experiments that are recently been published show that developers often do not know sufficient implementation details. So sometimes they will assume that a certain uh, method provided by the framework is secure, but in fact it is lacking some, uh, uh, some yeah, the implementation is lacking. So I, I've wondered about this as well, what the best solution would be, and I'm not sure yet. One option that I see is make everything very obvious what the implementation is. So I've seen frameworks that have like password uh, hasher or something like that as the name, while the developers should maybe know which algorithm is being used and it should be very clear in the name which one is used because clearly if they know how to do it in the plain language, it should be should be possible to know how to do it in the framework as well, as long as it's clear enough. But on the other hand, making things more complicated like this would also in, in, be contradictory to what a framework is supposed to do. So I, I'm, I'm not sure what the right solution is yet. And it's some, some things that still need to be researched more thoroughly, I think. Um, yeah, to elaborate on the previous question on frameworks, there was an next slide that says that exercises with longer code snippets also are more difficult. I think exercises with frameworks are also longer, so have you corrected for that uh, effect? Uh, yes, so uh, both the intelligent tutoring system with these uh, uh, item response theory as well as my statistical tests take care of that. So the, it is on, it, it is really this uh, variable alone that ha is measuring an increased effect. Okay, thank you. Great presentation and great research, by the way. Peter. Just, just a question, you've called it a human-centric approach to software security. Mm -hmm. This is really about writing software, right? Uh, but you also have something like designing software. So have you done some research? Have you looked at how, um, how much of this methodology can we apply to other aspects of software security? I, I haven't done research about that, but I assume it, it's beneficial in, in all parts of the software development. We should not only focus on is the final product what we want, but we really need to help the people involved upskill and make some of their tasks easier and really think about the experience of those people. So in case of the developers, I've called it human-centered because we often consider tools that are 
very good at scanning the code, but we don't consider what does this, what is the developer experience when using these tools. So I, in, in design, I, while I have not done any clear research, I really think that a similar approach can be useful. Yeah. I think because this, this is one thing that I find important. Uh, you know, if you look at software security, it's just much broader than just writing the code. Yeah. That's true. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Any more questions? Other research insights to share? All right. Thank you, Peter. Thank you for your interesting research.